Now, as the name of the video implies, this is the third part of a story, so if you haven't seen the first two parts yet, I'd highly recommend checking them out first, or this likely won't make any sense to you. Links to them will be in the description below. And now, without further ado, let's get back to the story. We again find ourselves on a lush blue and green world, where this time we watch as the young boy from last time, who again is maybe around the age of 14 or so, follows a young girl who is roughly his same age, through a dense forest of tall ancient trees and thick underbrush. And upon the boy's face is a rather nervous look as he calls out to her, we should really be getting back, master warned me that... But before he can finish what he's about to say, the girl stops, whirls around, and quickly says, Why do you call him that? The question causes the boy to blink in confusion a few times before he simply says, Because that's who he is? The girl rolls her eyes and giggles. Master is a title, not a name. The boy doesn't seem to know what to say to that and falls silent. The girl then turns back around and keeps heading through the woods, and the boy follows. A short time later, the girl asks over her shoulder, Why don't you ever talk about your life before you were brought here? Before I was brought here? Yeah, what was your home planet like? The boy says nothing and only looks more confused than ever. The girl then says, Wait, were you born here then? The boy shrugs. I guess, yeah, I, I just always thought. The girl turns her head for a moment and gives him a thoughtful look before, saying as she continues on, My home planet was much different from this. It wasn't so green, that's for sure. She then plucks a leaf from a tree, and with a small smile on her face that is half joy and half sadness, she says, This is a nice change. Though I do miss my family. Your family? The boy says mostly to himself, and he becomes so lost in thought that he doesn't realize the girl has stopped, and he smacks right into her back, causing her to stumble forward a few steps and almost into a giant creature. Silent and unmoving, the large, white, fuzzy creature that is more than twice their height only stares at the young girl, and that's when the boy whispers, I tried to tell you, the master says creatures live in these woods. The girl slowly shakes her head from side to side and whispers back, There are no creatures anywhere near this big where I come from. The boy gives a slight frown to that and then says as he slowly moves in front of the girl, Just run. I'll try and keep him distracted. The girl shakes her head. It'll eat you. And as if on cue, the creature rears back and up to its full height and lets out a deafening roar. And as soon as it does, it seems like it's about to lunge forward and attack. But just before it does, it almost seems to freeze in place. That's when we focus in on the face of the girl, who turns her head from side to side, looking from the boy to the creature, and we see, and she sees, and realizes that they're staring into each other's eyes, and it's almost as if there is a look of understanding upon both their faces. This goes on for several seconds, until a small animal suddenly runs out from the underbrush and distracts both the boy and creature, and whatever connection they had formed is suddenly broken. And once again, the creature lets out a roar, an even angrier one this time, and rears back like it's about to attack, but again it stops just before it does. And now, emerging from out behind a tree, we see the master, again wearing his mask, and we watch as he walks up to the creature and pats it gently, and in response it's almost as if the beast nods at him before ambling away into the woods. The girl, looking amazed, simply says, How? How did you control it like that? The boy quickly speaks up before the master even has a chance to answer. He didn't. He connected with it. Made it understand we weren't a threat to it. The girl gives a chuckle. The thing thought we were a threat to it? We snuck up on it. Startled it. The girl, her eyes locked in the direction the creature just ran off in, says, I can't imagine that thing being afraid of anything, much less us. The master then says, There are many beasts in these woods that are larger than even this one that would gladly make a meal of it. The girl's eyes go wide. Even bigger than that? Why don't we ever see any of them? Why don't they just come up and wreck our hut and eat us? The master doesn't respond, and instead a look of realization comes to the boy's face, and he turns and looks at the master, and as he speaks, there's a look of profound respect upon the boy's face. You keep them away, don't you? Again, the master says nothing, and in the silence the boy seems to rethink what he just said and corrects himself. No. It's not that you keep them away. You somehow let them know that we're not a threat, and we also wouldn't make much of a meal, I guess. The master lays a hand on the boy's shoulder and gives him a single firm nod of the head and says, You're beginning to understand, and are now ready to be trained. We then switch scenes and find ourselves on a city planet during the day, where Luke Skywalker and the young Ben Solo walk side by side down a bustling street 
packed with beings of all different species, while overhead, countless speeders and ships fly by. We then hear Luke say to Ben, You seem uncomfortable. Ben nods a bit and responds, When there's so many people around, it's hard to concentrate. To control, I guess. What is? Luke asks. Ben remains tight-lipped for a few long seconds, before finally saying, It's like I can sense everyone around me, and the more people there are, the more crowded out I feel. Ben shakes his head as if frustrated or like he wasn't happy with the description he gave. After another long moment of silence, he then says, Sometimes, when I try to, I can even hear what others are thinking. Luke considers that for a moment and says, Is that why you attacked the boy at school? Could you hear what he was thinking? Ben, looking a bit ashamed, only nods his head. The two then walk quietly for a few moments, and that's when we briefly focus in on the crowded street all around them, and watch as people slow down as they pass by, and hear them muttering amongst themselves as they do. One strange alien even says to another, Could that really be him? The real Luke Skywalker? But the other responds, Nah, that can't be him. The real Luke Skywalker is much taller. We then focus back in on the face of Luke, and can tell that he seems to be actively trying to ignore all the looks and comments he's getting. Ben looks up at Luke and seems to notice this and says, Is it hard for you too? Luke gives an ever so slight nod of the head and says, Yes, even after all this time it can be overwhelming. Ben is quiet for a moment, then, looking a bit worried, looks up at Luke and asks, Are you going to take me away? Luke seems caught off guard by the question, and after looking for the right thing to say, he finally responds, That depends entirely on what you want. Ben looks around at the people who continuously seem to be gawking at Luke, while not giving him even the slightest glance. He then says, I want to be a hero, like you. But Luke quickly shakes his head. That's not what Jedi do. That response confuses Ben, and he says, but you saved the galaxy. You killed Vader and the Emperor. You're like the greatest hero ever. Luke gives something like an uncomfortable grin and says, That's not exactly what happened. Not at all, really. Vader and Palpatine were defeated because I put my faith in another, not because of any power I possess. Ben, looking almost angry to hear that, shakes his head vehemently in response, But everyone said that you... But Luke cuts him off and says, The life of a Jedi is not the life of a hero, Ben. That's not the point. Not at all. It's a deep commitment. A devotion to a way of life and a belief that there should be balance in this galaxy. Ben makes a bit of a face and says, That doesn't sound very exciting. It actually sounds rather boring. Luke's face goes distant for a moment and he responds, Excitement and adventure. A Jedi doesn't crave such things. Ben seems disappointed to hear that and the two keep walking. After a few moments, Luke seems like he's about to say something, but instead his attention is drawn elsewhere, to a nearby darkened alley. And though Luke is too distracted to notice, Ben too seems to sense something coming from the alley. Ben then says, What is it? What's down there? Luke shuts his eyes for a good long while, then when he opens them, with an even more distant expression upon his face, and almost as if he's repeating something he's just heard, Luke says, Only what you take with you. Ben just gives him a look as if he doesn't understand. Then Luke glances down at him and seems to be reminded of where he is and what's going on. Ben again asks, what's down there? And this time Luke says, I'm not sure. He then winks at Ben and continues, but if you're up for a little adventure and excitement, we can go and find out. To that, Ben only smiles and nods eagerly. The two then head off towards and soon enter the seemingly empty alley, and after walking a good way down it, they come to some graffiti sprayed on a wall. And as Luke reads it aloud, he reaches out his hand and runs it over the crimson red letters, almost as if he can't believe they're real. Vader lives, Luke says. Why would anyone spray this on a wall? Ben quickly says. It's been happening all over the planet, all over the galaxy, actually. Surprised you haven't heard about it. Luke frowns and looks at the hand that ran over the graffiti and sees the paint was still wet and some has come off on his hand. He then says, looking all around him, I've heard about it, but I guess I didn't want to believe it. That's when both Ben and Luke notice a dark cloaked figure emerge from a hiding spot somewhere down the alley, and as this figure boldly strides towards them, we see that they wear some type of dark mask with silver accents, and then we hear it say, It is as was promised by our immortal master. Our patient devotion has been rewarded. A chance for vengeance upon the abdicator of the darkness has been granted. Behind the cloaked figure now, we see three more similar to him emerge, though these ones do not wear masks and wield primitive-looking melee weapons. The first cloaked figure then ignites a crimson red lightsaber and says, You will die this day, Jedi, and be cast into the unending nothingness that awaits all who fail to serve him. To all of that, 
Luke sighs as if he's far more annoyed than worried. Luke then gives Ben a gentle shove, but at first Ben only frowns and glares at the figures that continue to quickly approach. Finally though, after a warning look from Luke, Ben turns and starts to run towards the alley exit. But as soon as he does, three more dark, cloaked figures emerge to block his way. Ben stops dead in his tracks, and Luke glances back at the three new figures behind him, then turns his head back around to see the other four, including the one with the lightsaber, still quickly approaching. Yet despite now facing seven potential attackers, the calm, almost sympathetic look on Luke's face does not change, and he says, I can sense the fear from all of you, the loneliness. You seek a place and purpose in this galaxy, but you don't believe it has either for you, so you have turned to something you do not fully understand. Luke reaches out a hand to them and then continues, I can help you. I can help all of you turn away from this darkness that you believe you serve. The cloaked figure halts, cocks his head a bit, and replies, Darkness that we believe we serve? Could it be that the legendary Luke Skywalker does not sense it? That he does not feel the stirring within the Force that even we, those who were not born with the gift, can feel and know is coming? The figure lets out a bold laugh that echoes throughout the alley and then says, even if you survive this day, Jedi, you will not survive what is coming. You will not survive his return. Luke, his calm resolve unbroken, simply says, Vader is dead. The figure quickly snaps back. But what he started is not. We are his legacy, and soon there will be a return, and you will be the last of your kind, Jedi. Once again, Luke lets out a sigh that is a mix of frustration and sadness. He then ignites his green saber and says... I am sorry for this. And then he quickly raises his free hand and force pushes the four figures in front of him, sending them all flying through the air. He then turns and sees that the three figures behind him have begun to charge. He then takes a moment to glance down at Ben and says with a half grin upon his face, Jedi don't crave excitement, but we don't run from it either. Ben then watches with a look of awe and amazement upon his face as Luke easily sidesteps the attacks from the three figures and one by one, uses his lightsaber to shear their crude melee weapons in half, before force pushing them into the walls and apparently knocking the wind out of them and leaving them near unconsciousness. From above then, two more figures drop down and out of concealment, and also attack Luke. But just like with the previous three, they are quickly disarmed and knocked out. Luke then lowers his saber and looks to Ben, and sees that the young boy is looking absolutely and completely enthralled by everything he's just witnessed. Ben then bends down and picks up and begins to study a piece of one of the severed weapons that happened to land near him, and while he's distracted by it, we watch as Luke ever so nonchalantly raises a hand out towards Ben and concentrates. But soon enough, Luke opens his eyes and just lets out a soft sigh, as if he wasn't able to sense anything. Ben then looks up towards Luke like he wants to ask a question about the weapon he holds, but instead his little eyes go wide and he screams out, Watch out! And Luke raises his saber and whirls around, just in time to see that the first hooded figure is not only directly behind him, but about to impale him with his crimson red lightsaber. But instead of that happening, the hooded figure seems locked or frozen in place, and only twitches as it fights against this, almost as if some sort of energy is now flowing through him and freezing him where he stands. For a few seconds then, Luke studies the cloaked and masked figure in disbelief, as if he's never seen anything like it before, and then turns and looks at Ben and sees the young boy has a hand stretched out towards the figure, and there is a struggling expression upon his face, as if it's taking everything he has and more to keep the figure frozen where he stands. And before Luke can say or do anything else, Ben seems to lose his hold and the cloaked figure seems to purposely impale himself upon Luke's green lightsaber. Quickly then, Luke deactivates his saber and the figure crumbles to the ground, and keeps muttering something in a strange language over and over again that, apparently, Luke doesn't understand. In seconds though, the muttering stops, there is a gurgling sound, and the figure goes completely silent and still. In the next instant then, Luke reactivates his saber when he realizes that two more of the cloaked figures are running down the alley at them with weapons raised. Luke glances at Ben and tells him to wait here, and he takes off to meet them. That's when Ben approaches the body of the figure and kneels down next to it, his focus on the strange mask that he wears. Ben reaches out to touch the mask, and that's when the figure suddenly snaps to life, and snatches Ben by the arm, and simultaneously pulls Ben closer, and leans up towards him a little bit, and says just above a whisper, My master waits for you. In the darkness, he waits for you. His body then goes limp again, and Ben yanks his arm free, and that's when his attention goes to the lightsaber clutched in the dead man's hand. 
with some effort then, Ben pries it free, and as he's looking it over, it suddenly gets yanked out of his hand and flies over to Luke, who has now finished taking care of the other two attackers. That's no toy, Luke says with a stern look upon his face, now standing over Ben. Ben then jumps to his feet, balls his hands into fists, and for the briefest of moments, looks absolutely furious. But the look quickly fades, and he then lowers his head and mutters something that sounds like an apology. Luke regards him quietly for a moment, and then says, holding up his own lightsaber just a bit, The hardest part about being a Jedi, Ben, is knowing when and where to use this weapon. And if you choose this life, having one will be a responsibility you have to earn. Ben looks up and simply asks, Would you choose this life? Without thinking, Luke replies, Of course. That answer seems to confuse Ben, and he says back, That's not what I saw in your mind. Luke crouches down before Ben, and then says, when did you peer into my mind? Ben starts to apologize, but Luke shakes his head and assures him it's okay, and asks when he looked and what he saw there. Last night, Ben finally says, when Mom seemed worried that something had happened to me. I wasn't trying to, I swear, but suddenly it was like your thoughts were my own. Luke nods. That may have been my fault, Ben. I was trying to peer into your mind at the time, and couldn't. Ben's eyes narrow a bit, and he echoes, couldn't? His eyes narrow even further, and that's when he says, Wait, why were you trying to look into my mind? Luke then shakes his head and puts his hands on Ben's shoulders and says, I'm going to be honest with you, Ben. The Force seems unusually strong with you, and I don't know why or what it even means. But what you just did, freezing someone like that, I didn't even know it was possible. Ben gives a little bit of a shrug and says, I, I didn't try to do it. I, I just didn't want him hurting you. Luke smiles and ruffles Ben's hair a bit and says, It's quite all right that you did it. You saved my life. I'm just not entirely sure what to do about it is all. Ben then says to that, Because you really don't want to be a Jedi, is that it? Luke gives Ben a questioning look, and the young boy explains, That's what I saw in your mind. You were walking away from it all. Luke shakes his head and says, No, Ben, there's nothing that could ever make me walk away from this life. I've made my choice. Ben quickly says back, but you weren't alone. There was a woman with you. Luke stands back up straight and makes a motion with his head indicating it's time they should go already. He then says, what you saw is a dream I sometimes have, Ben. A dream where I never left Tatooine and instead married this dark-haired woman I used to know. A woman whose name I honestly can't even recall right now. With that said, Luke gives a bit of a casual shrug and begins to walk out of the alley. When he's a few paces ahead, Ben mutters to himself, but you weren't on Tatooine and her hair wasn't dark, it was red. That's when we switch scenes, and we find ourselves focused in on the face of Mara Jade, and at the moment she looks extremely skeptical, though Thrawn, who stands at her side, looks quite the opposite, and seems confident in apparently whatever he's just explained to her. And as we pull back and away, we see the bigger picture, and we find the two of them standing in front of the strange pyramid-shaped structure that resides within the village of the amphibious creatures, the one that a glowing crimson red stone hovers just above. Mara then says, If we desecrate this thing, they'll kill us for sure. Thrawn shakes his head. I disagree. If these creatures truly believe you to be some sort of long-awaited chosen one of the dark side, they will tolerate any action you may take, even those that might otherwise appear sacrilegious. Mara frowns and looks all around her, and notes that a couple dozen of the creatures seem to be lurking about in the shadows, clearly curious about what they're doing. Thrawn then continues, Besides, I suspect these creatures are already aware of the truth that we are about to uncover, that this structure is little more than a ruse to hide what is truly important here. Mara gives Thrawn a questioning look, and then the chist continues, I have been observing these creatures for years now, and never do they even bother to guard this structure, or in turn, the stone atop it. Mara shrugs and says, So, what's that prove? It proves that they are not so concerned about it being taken, which to me implies that, as I have said, it is a ruse and is meant to draw the interest of any would-be thief, something that they will take while leaving the real prize untouched. Mara then gives a dubious look, but takes a hold of her lightsaber and ignites it anyway, and a crimson red blade springs to life. Let's hope you're right about this, she says as she begins to hack away at the structure, and as she does, none of the amphibious creatures make any sort of move to stop her. They all just continue to watch from the shadows. In no time then, the structure is completely destroyed. The stone that once hovered atop it is no longer glowing, and is lost in a pile of hacked apart wood and bone. And where the structure once stood is a hole in the ground, 
one just large enough for a person to climb down. Mara then approaches the edge of the hole and stares down into total darkness. She lowers her saber to see if the red glow will give off any sort of hints about what might be down there, but still nothing can be seen. That's when one of the amphibious creatures, the one who was once their chieftain and wears a mask, approaches Mara and says something to her in a strange language. What did he say? Thrawn asks after the creature speaks his piece and then walks away. Mara replies. If I'm right, he said that anything but a true servant of darkness will be rejected by whatever is down there. Thrawn raises an eyebrow and says to that, Am I to assume by the nervous expression upon your face that you do not believe yourself to be a true servant of the darkness? To that, Mara, as she stares down the hole, says, Sidious once asked me if I ever felt anything, heard any sort of call come from somewhere out there. When Mara doesn't finish, Thrawn asks, And what did you tell him? I told him that I didn't, and I couldn't tell if that pleased or disappointed him. He did not tell me to worry, though. Even Lord Vader could not hear the call. Thrawn seems to consider that for a moment and then says, perhaps because, like you apparently, Lord Vader lacked a certain level of commitment to the dark side, a level the likes of only someone like Sidious could attain. Mara gives him an incredulous look and replies, Lack of commitment. Vader was the very epitome of the dark side. And here I thought you said you knew him better than I. Thrawn gives a single nod of the head and says, I clearly do if you think that Lord Vader was a creature born of malevolence and not love. Mara seems like she's about to argue, but Thrawn doesn't give her the chance and says, And now it seems you must decide how strong your own connection and commitment to the dark side is. To that, Mara flashes Thrawn a cold look, and without a single word, begins to crawl down into the hole. We then switch scenes, and find ourselves back on the city planet with Luke and Ben, and now see that the two are riding in a fast-moving elevator, presumably heading up to the apartment in the sky that Ben calls home, and where an eager Leia and Han likely await news about their son's possible future training as a Jedi. We then hear Ben ask, Would you really choose this life of a Jedi? I mean, really? Luke gives a bit of a sigh in response, As I've told you, Ben, you don't have to decide today, but you will have to decide very soon. Ben nods in understanding and the two are quiet for a few moments, but then Ben says, You didn't answer my question though. Would you really choose this life? Or would you walk away from it if you could? Luke simply replies, I can't just walk away from it, Ben. With a true childhood innocence then, Ben simply gives a big exaggerated shrug and says, But why not? What's making you stay a Jedi? Instead of giving any sort of immediate answer, Luke falls into deep thought. And by the expression upon his face, it seems clear this is a question. He has asked himself many times before. Before either of them can say anything else, the elevator comes to a halt and the doors slide open. But it's not Han and Leia that wait for them there. Instead, dressed in white robes, is none other than Ahsoka Tano. And upon her face is almost a pleading expression as she wordlessly begins to hand a lightsaber in the direction of Luke Skywalker. A lightsaber that once belonged to him and his father before him. And all Luke does is stare at that lightsaber with an impossible to discern expression upon his face. And that is where this part ends. Well, that's all I've got for this time. And this is where I'd once again like to take a moment to thank all the names you see on your screen who have been a part of bringing these stories to you by contributing their great artwork. And if you're an artist and are interested in joining the team, please send me an email at the address in the description below. And with that said, now it's your turn to tell me what you thought of this part of the story and what you think might happen next. So leave a comment below and let's talk some Star Wars. And until next time, thanks for watching.